So we spent a lot of time talking about the central dogma and what's meant by gene expression. So it's important to note that when we talked about transcription, we said it occurred on an as-needed basis. Well, how does a cell know when it needs to transcribe a gene? So we're going to talk about gene regulation and exactly how a cell knows when to transcribe, how much it to transcribe, etc. So how energetically favorable is it for a cell to produce unnecessary proteins? Okay, not very. So that's when gene regulation comes into play. So this is a phenomenon that our gene expression level can vary under different circumstances. So depending on if you need it or not, is if we're going to make it or not, or how much we're going to make it. So there's something called constitutive genes. These genes are unregulated. They are being made consistently. Okay, These genes tend to be necessary for the survival of the organism. So they are always being produced at low levels. Or I'd rather say at a constant level. These tend to be housekeeping genes. Then you have regulated genes. Now these are the genes that we're about to talk about how they are processed or when. These genes have to be made in certain cells at certain times in proper amounts. So this is what's going to be met by regulation. So how do we know when to make these genes? When do we make these genes? How do we stop making those genes? So what are some common processes that you can think of that might be regulated at the genetic level? So things that we can turn off and on. Okay, so the answer one, genes involved in metabolism. Okay, so some proteins function in the metabolism of small molecules. So we only need to make those proteins slash enzymes when those molecules are present. Otherwise, we don't need them. Some are in response to environmental stress. So if we enter some kind of conditions where like it's heat shock or osmet osmotic shock, then we need to make proteins to help us deal with that. But if we don't face those challenges, we don't need those proteins. And then cell division. So think about the genes necessary for cell division, the polymerases, the microtubules, etc. We only need to make those genes when it's time to divide. Other than that, if our cell is in G0, it has no purpose for those genes, so it wouldn't make them, okay? So we're going to regulate genes so that we don't spend unnecessary time producing molecules that we don't need. We can regulate at several different points. So the most energetically favorable is transcription. This is before we even make it, okay? But if we do make it, so we can control here the rate or we can stop so we can control how much we're making or we can start to transcribe and then stop say oh wait we don't need that after all then we can regulate the, the translation so we have this mrna produced but it doesn't have to become a protein and i know if you think about the um the non-coding rnas so here this is our antisense rna mi rna these are things that say oh let me go find that mrna and stop it because we don't need to make it into a protein or we can do it at the post-translational level. So after the proteins is made, but before they become a functional product, or let's say after the polypeptide is made and before it becomes a functional protein, we can stop it. So these are different levels that we can still regulate gene expression. So even though we transcribe a gene, it's not too late to not make it a functional protein. So when we talk about regulating our genes, there are several different things that play a role in it. One is going to be these regulatory proteins. So one such regulatory protein is an activator. Activators tend to increase the rate of transcription. If an activator is present, this is considered to be under positive control. Okay, activator, positive control. Then we have our repressors. Our repressors tend to inhibit or slow down translation. If regulation involves a repressor, it's under negative control. So activator positive, repressor negative. Then our regulatory proteins tend to have two binding sites. One is an allosteric site that an effector can bind to. And when the effector binds, it tends to change the shape of our protein. And that will allow it to either bind or not bind to our DNA. Okay. 
So two sites, the allosteric site for infector protein, the DNA binding site. The allosteric site can change the shape of our protein, okay? Either allowing it to bind to DNA or stopping it. So here, for example, you have an effector. The effector binds the allosteric site into a way that it binds to our DNA and transcription. This arrow shows you transcription is occurring. Trans this arrow dictates transcription. Here, transcription cannot occur. Our repressor is here. It's bound to the DNA. This effector binds to the repressor, takes it off of the DNA, and allows transcription to occur. So, effector molecules come in a variety. So, one is an inducer. An inducer's job is to increase, so inducer increases transcription. It can induce in two ways. One, it can prevent the repressor from binding to the DNA and stopping transcription, or it can bind to an activator and help it to bind to a DNA and help transcription. Our co-repressor binds a repressor and helps it to bind to the DNA to repress, and an inhibitor binds to an activator and stops it from binding to a DNA. Okay, so these are all effector molecules that will bind to the allosteric site. Now, two types of operons. They can be repressible or inducible. If they're repressible, they're usually on, but you can turn them off. Okay. If they're inducible, they're normally off, but you can do something to turn them on. And we're going to go through what these things are. So I'll note here, we talked about our promoter region, and we know that this is where transcription usually occurs. There's an operator region, and the operator in bacteria is where the repressor binds, okay? So the operator is a binding site for a repressor. So repressible operon, normally on. If it's on, that means this repressor here, because they have an operator, is not bound to it. But if the co-repressor binds to the repressor, Gives it, you see, this change in the shape allows it to bind to the operator. It stops. So we turn it off. Here it's off. So we have our repressor. It's bound to the operator. Transcription can occur. Well, this inducer comes, binds to the repressor, changes the shape, makes it fall off. Transcription can occur. So if it's positive, it has an activator. Negative, it has a repressor. Repressible, normally on, can turn it off inducible normally off can turn it on now let's put those things together in just a second so i'll also talk about here bacteria genes tend to be arranged in operons and this is just two or more genes under the control of a single promoter okay so here we have our promoter here are several genes these are all going to be transcribed together and they create a polycystronic mrna or this mrna molecule that makes several different genes. Okay, so operons tend to make polycystronic mRNA. And in bacteria, their genes tend to be arranged in operators. And if you think about it, their genomes are small. They have very limited space. So they are trying to take advantage and maximize their efficiency. So one way by doing it is reducing the promoters. All of these genes work together in the same pathway. So if we need one, we need all. So if we have to transcribe one, we might as well transcribe them all at the same time under one promoter. As compared to having a promoter for lac C, one for lac Y, and one for lac A, that takes up a lot of space. So if we put these things together, you can have a negative inducible operon. What does that mean? If it's negative, you have a repressor. If it's inducible, it's off, right? but you can turn it on. So when it's turned off, you'll see here it's off when it has a repressor bound to the operator. And we can turn it on by having something bind. So our subst or not our substrate. I'm blanking on it. Some so we can have our effector molecule bind to the repressor, change the shape, make it fall off. When it falls off, transcription can occur. If it's negative, repressible. Negative, it uses a repressor, repressible on, but you can turn it off. So here you have the repressor. 
the repressor is inactive. It's not on, so transcription is occurring. So for this to be on, the repressor is not bound to the DNA. Well, we have an effector. Binds to our repressor, changes the shape, makes our repressor bind to the DNA, turns it off. If it's positive, inducible. Positive means it has an activator. Inducible, off, but you can turn it on. So if it's off, it requires this activator. Activator is not on the DNA. Transcription is not occurring. You want to turn it on. Effect the molecule, binds to the activator, changes the shape, allows the activator to bind to the DNA. When the activator binds to the DNA, it's going to increase the rate of transcription. And if it's positive, repressible, positive, activator, repressible, off, on, but you can turn it off. So for this to be on, you have your activator on your DNA, transcription is occurring. You want to turn it off, effector binds to the activator, makes the conformational change, causes it to fall off of the DNA, and this is no longer transcribing. Okay? So one way, if you can remember what positive, negative, inducible, and repressible means, you should be okay. So positive requires an activator. Negative requires a repressor. Repressible, on, but you can turn it off. Inducible, off, but you can turn it on. And if you remember those things, then you should be able to think through any problem asking you about those.